everyone. Welcome back to the second panel. As I said before the break, it's going to be a very interesting set of case studies of Odessa and Kharkiv, exposing the thematic of this conference in a very precise setting. And I would want to start with introducing our distinguished speakers. Are we having Professor Chernetsky on board? Yes, wonderful. Good morning. <laughs> nice to, he to, to have you with us. Thank you. Great to be with you. Don't hear you. Uh, how about now? Okay, that was my problem. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. So, no Thank you for being so generous that you spent the Thanksgiving morning with us and, and sorry about that <laughs> at the same time. Uh, in any case, I think it's a very interesting coincidence because it works for the topic of the conference as a certain example of cultural interpretation of the hard colonial experience. So happy Thanksgiving in the first place. Yeah. And let me speak a couple of words to introduce our first speaker, although I believe he does not need any special introduction. So Vitaly Chernetsky is an associate professor in Slavic literature and studies at the University of Kansas. And, uh, oh, sorry, I have some issues here. Um, uh, he has, a broad readership across the world for, I believe, almost 10 years. Professor Chernetsky had been the director of this. Oh my God, I, I lost my notes. Sorry, I wanted to be so precise. Then I, I would just say the main thing of all the publications and academic achievements, I would probably mention one the resonant study uh, an award-winning book, Mapping Post-Communist Cultures, Russia and Ukraine, which was translated into Ukrainian. And personally, for me, I would mention one uh, article with a very precise, laconic and apt title, Post-Colonial, Post-Colonialism, Comma, Ukraine and Russia, which I'm usually giving as mandatory reading for my students in the courses on Ukraine. So thanks for it. Yes. Um, so the floor is yours. I look forward right. to the presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Koroblova. And I also would like to uh, thank uh, Radomir Mokrek, who invited me and uh, to participate in the conference. And uh, good to see you, Radko, and uh, have very fond memories of uh, discussing various topics related to Ukrainian culture and history uh, in uh, Britain when you were at the time and when I was visiting. Uh, can you, everyone hear me all right? Uh, Radko, can you give a thumbs up, please? Yes, cool. I am going to start my PowerPoint now and uh, hopefully that works. Uh, so um, let me see if I have the capability to share the screen at my side, I do. Nope, I don't. Uh, could you please enable me to share the screen? Okay, thank you. It looks like I can. And here is the PowerPoint. And play from start. So, um, I was uh, hoping to cover a lot of territory here and uh, make it a more academic talk. However, there was something that I came across very recently that sent me uh, on a somewhat different personal direction. So with your indulgences, I'll start with that. And this is this uh, document, uh, which I found on an independent news uh, site from Odessa called Dumskaya. Um, and it is, as you can see, a document of the protocols of 
arrests and executions from 1937, specifically November 17th, 1937. And it's just one of the many pages. And when I saw it, uh, and I saw specifically the uh, last names under the names two, three, and four, uh, chill uh, went down my spine because Beitelspacher is the last name of the German side of my family. So uh, the Beitelspacher family in the German colonies right outside the city of Odessa was a very close-knit family. So these folks are my distant relatives. I did not know that they were shot in 1937 and that they buried in a uh, mass execution grave site on the edge of the village, which now is called Prelemanske, was renamed after World War II and used to be called Tatarka. You can see here uh, where it is, uh, the village is on the map vis-a-vis -vis the city center and where that site is located, as you can see, there is nothing there that is visible. I'm just trying to make sure that you can see. You can, if you look at this area, there's a small cross with a uh, piece of cloth. Uh, this was put by a Polish person on the site where uh, his father uh, because his father was one of the victims who was buried here. So this is the only marker that we have. So this is a site in terms of the numbers of people executed comparable to other major sites in Ukraine. Uh, we're talking about tens of thousands of people. Uh, and it was uncovered during World War II, similarly to Vinnytsia, uh, which is fairly well known in historical research. But uh, in the case of o Odessa, there have not been any serious studies, even though there was this German and Romanian commission that uh, studied the site. We know, of course, of the paradox that, you know, the Nazis, of course, so have perpetrated their own uh, atrocities in Ukraine, but they at the same time uncovered the atrocities perpetrated by the Soviets. This was a site where most of the uh, folks who were shot were members of ethnic minorities, so a lot of ethnic Germans, ethnic Poles, and others. And as you see, no marker, and no site except for that one iron cross with uh, the ribbon, the colors of the Polish flag. So uh, this leads me to just say that I am in some sense a typical Ukrainian and a typical Odessan in that my, uh, if I look into the history of my family, here is a small laundry list for you ever, you know, to consider. Uh, Decolocization, two of my four grandparents went through that. Holodomor, uh, three of my Four grandparents were born in villages um, not far from Odessa, and they were directly affected by it. They fortunately, all three of them survived, but they lost family members. Stalinist terror, in addition to the site at Tatarka that I just mentioned, uh, a great uncle of mine, my grandmother's brother, died in the camps in Koloma. The Holocaust, my most of my family is not Jewish, but I have uh, Jewish family relatives by marriage, uh, including my one of my grandmother's first husbands, uh, first husband, he was Jewish. He perished uh, from in the first days of Odessa's occupation uh, in 1941. Survival under Nazi occupation was also very difficult and uh, Another grandmother uh, was able to rescue her husband, my grandfather, who was near death uh, from a POW camp uh, located near Yesunovata in Donetsk, which required traveling from the Romanian occupation zone to the German occupation zone. And nobody knows how my grandmother was able to let them release her husband, but somehow she did and she brought him back home. 
and the post-war recovery was also very difficult. I just mentioned the Colomar camp that happened already in the early 1950s. And to top it all off, major floods uh, in the 1960s in the Parasip region, and the fact that I was born in the cholera year in Odessa. So you can get the full gamut of all those things. And I'm not saying this to emphasize that I was somehow special, but precisely to say that the case of my family is perfectly ordinary, typical for millions of families in Ukraine, because if we look at the context of the 20th century, we have a palimpsest of these kinds of multiple traumas. S S sorry, um, I'm having trouble with my PowerPoint. So if um, we look at the situation of Odessa, it is of course a city on the very edge of Ukraine, but it's a city that is closely connected with the rest of Ukraine. This connection, however, is often somehow buried, not realized. And here on the right, you can see a site of a 18th century Cossack cemetery, which actually predates uh, the uh, city being renamed Odessa and coming under Russian control. So it is a cemetery started by the Cossacks uh, who after the disbanding of the siege uh, in 1770, some of them migrated uh, to the Northern Black Sea coast. Um, this is a photograph from a few years ago. The cemetery has been cleaned up and uh, they are trying to maintain it, but it is still uh, typical for the city to have things in such sorry state. Uh, we have the city that has been beset by dominant myths. Uh, these myths are reproduced uh, by the Russian mass media um, and the minstrel version of the Odessa identity that they peddle through uh, works like the TV series Liquidation. This is very much uh, what the local tourist industry capitalizes on. And so even for Ukrainians who come to the city within domestic tourism, they get this story of Odessa and not the story of the city connected to other things. And unfortunately, very often by Western academics. So I am not here to attack my colleagues, but there are certain things that I would say are a bit surprising. And in those stereotypes, uh, the city is presented through, just like in Likvidatsa, through uh, the eyes of just uh, focus on one of the communities in the city, uh, primarily the Jewish community, which is presented in isolation of all others. And within it, it emphasizes not its contribution to the development of city and culture, but the stereotype associated with the um, street gangs, petty crime, um, something that is superficially colorful, but um, in many ways very shallow, and not the fact that you know Odessa was one of the major centers of Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment movement uh, that um, Mendele Moher Sforim or Shalom Aleichem are closely connected to the city and so on and so forth. To me, one of the most telling examples is the cover of uh, this uh, book uh, that you can see on the right um, by the American historian Roshana Sylvester, Tales of Old Odessa, Crime and Civility in a City of Thieves. So Odessa is called a city of thieves without quotation marks. And on the cover, you have, of course, the famous opera house, uh, supposedly the main den of thieves in that city. Uh, there are reasons to be upset. There are reasons to think that, you know, this is not something that you very much would want to see and appreciate as an enjoyable representation and meaningful, thoughtful representation of the city. The, these, of course, are not the only ways in which the city is depicted. 
we also have examples of, oh, sorry, uh, we need to go back, of competitive mythologization. Uh, one of the most unusual one is by the Canadian scholar Anna McCulkin, who is fascinated by the Italian presence in Odessa, which was of course a very important community uh, in uh, the city in the 19th century, but she overdoes it to such an extent that makes uh, Italians uh, the defining community in Odessa's history. And along the way, she, you know, rebaptizes as Italians uh, those uh, folks who actually were not necessarily Italian. So, for instance, many important Greek uh, residents of the city somehow become Italian in her book. Uh, just because they traded with the city of Livorno, which is a major Italian grain port, uh, gr port for the grain trade in the 19th century. So we have examples of one kind of stereotype. We have example of another kind of alternative attempt to create a stereotype. Neither of them is particularly productive. So uh, in trying to address the city, I have been pushing forward the uh, potential that could be brought by the employment of the concept of multidirectional memory. And multidirectional memory is uh, a concept introduced by uh, a colleague that I'm proud to call a friend, Michael Rothberg. He now teaches at the University of California, Los Angeles. And this is a title, uh, I mean, you see the cover of his book uh, from 11 years ago where he elaborated on that concept. Uh, Rothberg is uh, a scholar of the Holocaust primarily. And in this book, he connects uh, the narrative of the Holocaust to the narrative of the collapse of Western colonial empires and how when can discuss both events and both parts that, of, that of what generates traumatic memories in cultures without com competition, without making it a contest of competitive uh, victimization. So uh, um, hopefully people can read. And this is what he said in an interview. The concept of multidirectional memory was uh, my response to the tension between recognition of specificity of different traumatic histories and the need to avoid that, uh, turning that specificity into a sacralized uniqueness. So instead of competitive memory approaches, he uh, tries to put together a uh, system in which these memories can coexist and be in dialogue uh, in the process of uh, borrowing echoing interpretations, the non-zero sum uh, situation of uh, presence in society of uh, different memory narratives. And this is what he proposes to call multi-directional memory. Um, I am a little unhappy with my PowerPoint in that uh, with the Zoom screen sharing, the right side of it is appears being to cut off. But to be cut off, but uh, the important part that I would like to emphasize here is that uh, Rothberg, even though he discusses these very serious traumatic uh, things, is arguing for uh, presenting these kinds of memories as uh, ways of creating complex acts of solidarity. In the history of Ukraine, we of course uh, know just like in the history of other countries and here in the United States, the recent uh, election campaign is a key example of that, of inflaming and exaggerating differences, uh, creation of wedge issues. In the case of Odessa, if we go back and look at the map that I had here earlier, you can see here uh, Prospect Nebesno i Sotni. This is the wedge issue that dominated the mayoral elections in Odessa this year. 
uh, where uh, the um, candidates for mayor, several of them, including uh, Anadi Truhanov, uh, the apparent winner of the election, uh, and, the car and the previous mayor, wanted to rename back into uh, Prospect Marshal Azhukova. Um, so the uh, indirect conflict with the de decommunization laws. And uh, while Zhukov does have a connection to Odessa, uh, the, his role in the city was uh, anything but uh, positive. So uh, to come back to uh, our discussion of multi-directional memory, I very much hope that it uh, works to counteract those kind of things. The problem is, is that the local Odessa projects of multi-directional memory have so far been addressed and directed locally, trying to build local consensus uh, and with limited effect and not reverberating outside the city in the country. Thus, a, a city that is, which is one of Ukraine's major centers uh, which uh, at the beginning of the 20th century was Ukraine's largest city because there was a period of time when Odessa was larger than Kyiv. Uh, it remains marginalized, uh, remains cut off from meaningful presence in Ukrainian cultural discourse. And so uh, this is what I talked about. Uh, the optimistic uh, emphasis of uh, uh, Rothberg and his directions. We have had instead uh, the study of memory wars and memory at war. And some of those were very fruitful studies as the project uh, that was led by Alexander Etkind uh, at Cambridge um, in for several years, 2013, 2016, uh, examining uh, Poland, Russia, and Ukraine. And we have examples of very good explorations of multidirectional memory in the case of Lviv. And I'm just pointing here to perhaps best known the books by Olah Natyuk, Odvaga i Strach, Courage and Fear in the English translation, and Katarzyna Kotyńska's book uh, on Lviv and rereading the city anew. The book is available in Polish and in Ukrainian but to my knowledge, not yet in other languages. Uh, similar studies of Odessa are not there yet, but there are steps towards them that have appeared and there are efforts within the city. The, the effort, the, probably the most important of those efforts is attempts to create dialogue in uh, the wake of the tragedies of uh, May 2nd, 2014. And uh, this probably does not need uh, reminding, but the story was that a uh, pro-democracy, uh, pro-Ukrainian demonstration was attacked by pro-Russian thugs. Uh, two uh, persons were killed. Uh, the demonstration then continued to another site in the city, the old trade union buildings, the actually communist era uh, of Komparti. And uh, there in the confrontation, uh, a fire started. And in this case, uh, several people on the anti uh, Yevromaidan side. Uh, perished in the fire and uh, this tragedy was exploited by the Russian propaganda uh, in very vicious ways and again um, used uh, to inflame tensions, to create division, to obfuscate rather than to clarify what exactly happened in the city but there were a number of colleagues in the city who actually tried in an impartial open way to examine all the details and to get past uh, the emotions and heated rhetoric and uh, 
create a factual objective narrative, no matter how difficult it is. We have every time uh, there is a small step towards creating complex multifaceted uh, spaces of engagement and of dialogue, uh, the city suffers um, a lot of attacks on the folks who try to promote it. You see here the building of the City Art Museum and its current director, the notable Ukrainian artist Alexander Roitburd, um, who became uh, the uh, director of the museum in the aftermath of the Revolution of Dignity and who has uh, the museum and he personally sustained uh, really horrible pressure and attacks from anti uh, uh, from the uh, anti Yevromaidan anti reform sides within the local elite, especially the Odessa Oblast uh, uh, Regional Legislature, and uh, so this has remained a can of worms within the city, and the legislature, the regional legislature have tried several times in contravening Ukrainian laws actually to remove uh, Mr. Roitbord from his position as the museum director. And uh, it is something that is still tied in, up in courts. So he remains a director, but the position, I mean, there's always continuous sort of Damocles hanging over him, if you wish. I have to emphasize that while we're talking about dialogue tolerance and reconciliation, this is not a discussion of quote unquote, find people on both sides as uh, Donald Trump um, infamously said after the neo-Nazi uh, white supremacist uh, demonstrations in Charlottesville, Virginia. We do, however, this has to have a profound ethical grounding, but this ethical grounding has to be based on uh, uh, deeply engaging with the uh, event that happened. So uh, going back to Rothberg, this is his concept of the so-called fidelity to uh, the event, fidelity with the event that he takes from Alain Badiou and that he elaborates on in his book. There are such excellent examples of uh, multicultural presentations of, of what uh, has been happening in the city in the present and of a rich expanse uh, in Odessa's past. And uh, on the historical side, I would emphasize the work of the recently deceased wonderful historian Patricia Herlihy, who basically started serious historical scholarship on Odessa back in the early 1970s and continued alone and uh, uh, in collaboration with other colleagues. However, even here, things are not very simple. Uh, there was a wonderful tribute panel uh, to uh, Pat Hurley uh, recently at the ASIS convention, the biggest annual uh, Slavic East European and Eurasian Studies convention, which this year, like we're meeting today, happened online via Zoom. And it was a very moving panel. But I was really disturbed when one of the speakers, who actually got emotional and with tears uh, in her eyes, uh, remembering Pat, uh, ended up emphasizing the same old stereotype that Odessans are not really Ukrainians. And it, with all respect to that person's emotions about losing somebody who considered dear friend and colleague, I was absolutely heartbroken that the scholar nevertheless chose that very same moment to reassert the perpetration of the stereotypical narrative. Uh, the example of a colleague who does this a really excellent job on this in the context of 
complexity of the city's post uh, Soviet existence is the cultural geographer Tanya Richardson and her book uh, Kaleidoscopic Odessa, which you can see here. And this to me is a wonderful example of a book cover actually trying to make meaning. You see three typical houses from the city's one story 19th century building construction that were built of the local a limestone taken out of the catacombs by those very Cossacks whose crosses, whose graves you saw uh, in, earlier in my slideshow. And you see one of them covered with a Soviet style cement. You see one which they attempted to do a restoration of colors with mixed success. And we see one which is completely abandoned and the windows bricked in. Uh, and this is in the neighborhood of Moldovanka, which once again is something that many folks have heard because it has the stereotypical association with Odessa stories by Babel and other things of that nature. But I'm grateful to uh, Professor Richardson for presenting the non-tourist, the non-glamorous side of the city and inviting us through that image to connect with all the dense, complex, overlapping sides of where this city as a tangled space, as a, a reflection of the many, uh, you know, the palimpsest of many histories, many traumas, many engagements with the world, as, as a port city is a place of contact, and the place of contact not only with the sea, which in Odessa's case is hugely important, it's the most Mediterranean city in Ukraine, one must um, might argue, but also with the land, because otherwise it's not an island, it is very much something that is attached to the uh, Materekova Ukraina, to you, you know, Ukraine as uh, a landmass and of course as a polity. And if we look at the work of contemporary Ukrainian writers who are trying to work with this and who are trying to change uh, the stereotypes that have weighed on the city like a rock uh, probably one of the best known would be Boris Khersonsky, a wonderful poet uh, and diarist who uh, works both in Ukrainian and in Russian, who has done outstanding work with his personal with his personal family's archives and with memory archives more broadly within the city of Odessa and within Ukraine more broadly within the Jewish community, but also within communities that cut across ethnic and religious divides. And uh, his remarkable openness, his use first of live journal and then of Facebook as a public diary, which was then published in installments in book form, is an example of that kind of open diary as discourse, which uh, in the case of you know, East European literatures probably is best exemplified by uh, Vital Gombrowicz. I'm not saying that Hersonsky does exactly the same thing as Gombrowicz was doing in his diary uh, written back in Argentina and later in France, but there are similarities in both of them in that they uh, appeal to the shared uh, audiences, but also deliberately irritate those audiences. So irritating to provoke to think. And Khersonsky's series of vignettes about the character of Odeska Intelligentsia, the Odessa Intelligentsia, and its self-perception and its entanglement with pro-Russian imperial forces with Soviet KGB and its legacies and other kinds of things in 
becomes a, a, sto a collection of those little vignettes uh, about those stock characters, like a puppet show, if you wish, that continuously provokes one to think about it and take the city seriously. And needless to say, you can see that the book is illustrated by paintings by Alexander Oidburg. So we see the network of those who try to work with multi-directionality developing and growing within the city. But uh, perhaps, and this is uh, my final slide on which I'll stay for a while, the most interesting example of that would be Ivan Kozlenko's novel Tanger, and, uh, which was first published in 2007 in the Odessa-focused issue of the journal Kiev's Karus, and then in separately in a revised version in the book form in 2017. And Kozlenko's book is highly important as a deliberate, sustained, well-organized example of redirecting the city's discourse and taking the old myth and deliberately subverting, problematizing it and turning instead into engagement with a uh, potential to create new myth-making. Myth-making not in a sense of lies, but in creating narratives that could be foundations for new identities and new discourses. And in Kozlenko's case, I mean, the book is structured very interestingly in that we have a, a line set in the present, which in the case of the book is sort of late 1990s, early 2000s, and in the past, uh, during Vizvolny's Mahanya, Ukraine's War of Independence, and then in the roughly in 1926-27, at the time of the boom of Odessa as the center of the Ukrainian film industry, and the strong involvement of many Ukrainian cultural figures, writers, artists, theater directors, and others. And uh, Kozlenko here borrows from uh, the well-known no novel The Hours by Michael Cunningham, who engages in such way with Virginia Woolf's uh, classic novel, Mrs. Dalloway. So it has uh, Mrs. Dalloway and then uh, a present day uh, uh, narrative set in the present, which is related to Mrs. Dalloway. In Cunningham's novel, there is a third part also in the 1950s. Here we have a binary as opposed to a triangle, but Kozlenko still does it very well and he chooses as his intertext Yuri Yanovsky's novel Meister Korabla. And this uh, brings back the fact that we have a discourse on Odessa as a city in Ukrainian literature, including Ukrainian language literature. But in difference from Lviv, Odessa, Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, Ternopil, uh, Dnipro, you name it, somehow this does not come to mind. And people do not think that, say, Ivan Nechulovitsky set a novel in Odessa. And that if we look at the work of Yanovsky, Odessa and its environs are, of course, defining not only for Meister Korabla, but also for later works, because both Chaterishabli and Vershniki also are related to the city and the villages uh, the situated immediately outside it. So uh, Kozlenko in his novel emphasizes hybridity, ambiguity, and ambivalence of both recorded and mythologized history. So in Vesvolny's Mahanya, he uh, takes it upside he put, takes the conventional Soviet narratives and turns them upside down. He highlights that uh, which uh, is ambivalent, which is, could not be clearly painted black and white or red or white or Ukrainian versus white Russian versus Bolshevik versus Western occupation. And uh, that is in that complexity, he sees the strength, he sees the richness. 
And this is also what he sees in the 1920s, which are presented nostalgically as uh, a place of great freedom uh, and experimentation that was still possible. Uh, so the boom of, film, of silent cinema in 1926-27 is for Kozlenko that moment which allows us to see potential for rebuilding and recreating the city as a space of working through traumas and developing a new vision of the future. And with that, perhaps I will conclude and uh, thank you for your attention. I apologize if my remarks were a bit jumbled today, but I'm absolutely honored and delighted to take part in this conference. And I look forward to questions from colleagues in the audience, and I hope we can have a lively discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this fascinating presentation and indeed very insightful. Uh, so I'm reminding you all that we will have a Q&A session after both presentations. However, I encourage you to write your questions in the chat right now, uh, because I do believe that there are many questions. And now I'm planning to introduce our second speaker today, Dr. Ivan Kozachenko, who is an incoming Prisma Ukraine Ukraine Fellow at the Forum Transregionale Studium in Berlin. Dr. Kazuchenko received his PhD in Sociology from the University of Aberdeen, and later on he held research positions at the University of Cambridge and at the University of Alberta. His research interests include nationalism and diaspora studies, ethnic and linguistic identities in the post-Soviet states, and the role of social media and social movements. His most recent publications appeared in well-known outlets like Nations and Nationalism, Communist and Post-Communist Studies, and the Journal of European Studies. Today, Ivan will be presenting the case of Kharkiv, which is his and by coincidence my hometown, so I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Ivan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, kind uh, introduction, Valeria. So I also would like uh, to thank, to thank uh, organizers uh, for this wonderful event. And I'm uh, very honored uh, to take uh, uh, part in it. And special thanks for uh, Radomir Mokrik for inviting me. So uh, today I would, uh, just one second, share the screen. Okay, so uh, today my talk is dedicated to amnesia, changing memory sites and urban activism in the case of uh, Kharkiv. Uh, this is very much the research uh, in progress. So um, I really look forward uh, to feedback uh, on my preliminary studies, uh, findings. So first I would like to uh, outline the main ideas uh, that uh, guide uh, my study. Uh, first, uh, Narika Mukherjee um, points out that cities and urban environments can be seen as Andersonian imagined communities where identities of individuals are forged and asserted. Although most uh, people living in the city do not know each other, but they share similar feelings through certain architectural design and symbolic uh, connotations. Also, uh, Manuel Castells uh, stresses that only by analyzing the relationship between people and urbanization, we're able to understand cities and citizens at the same time. Uh, such relationship is most evident when people mobilize to change the city in order to change the society. And uh, I also use the ideas of Piotr Stomka, who was mentioned by Valeria earlier. And uh, his definition of cultural trauma uh, goes to the uh, cultural defined and interpreted shock to the cultural tissue. And the shocks may be war, acts of terrorism, collapses of empire. So the scope is uh, quite, quite wide here. 
And Stomka, Stomka argues that the trauma can be paralyzing rather than enabling identity, resulting in low levels of social cohesions. But at the same time, on, on some occasions, it may lead to uh, some positive uh, change. And uh, finally, I refer to uh, Stephen Schulman's uh, very important points about uh, national and supranational identity complexes for available for Ukrainian people. And uh, of course, I'm sure that uh, most of uh, present at our conference uh, know these uh, main markers or icons of nationalism of, uh, of, uh, of these uh, complexes, but I still uh, have uh, to briefly mention them. So for Ukrainian conservative national identity, like Stepan Bandera, Aoun and Opa, and general national struggle during the Second World War are important. Of course, uh, the Holodomor is, is crucial for this as well. And Cossack Dawn, uh, with the emphasis probably on the century long democratic tradition and traditions of uh, Cossack Dawn. And then it's possible to distinguish uh, Russophile and Sovietophile identities as uh, supranational ones. Although they are quite distinct, but uh, quite often they overlap in a very postmodern way. So uh, they refer broadly to Russian imperial symbols and orthodoxy. And then for Sovietophile, the central myth is the victory in the World War II and nostalgia for the Soviet Union. And once again, Cossack Dome, but uh, maybe with the emphasis on uh, orthodoxy and of course, uh, so-called reunification with Russia in 1654. So, and, um, and then, of course, uh, we discuss this uh, with some empirical cases a bit later. So what is so peculiar about Harkin's identity, its past and present? Uh, of course, this list could be much, much longer, but I want to highlight uh, just, uh, just several moments. So uh, first of all, it's the myth of the first capital, which is like really one of the central pillars of local identity. And uh, Kharkiv indeed was the capital of the Soviet Ukraine. But uh, and uh, this experience actually leaves the city with the ambition, which is quite rarely uh, met in the periphery. Uh, also, uh, Tatiana Zhurzhenko, who I probably seen as one of our participants, uh, describes it as a capital of despair, just because it was the capital of the Soviet Ukraine and uh, the capital of the most affected uh, region during the Holodomor. And uh, also the, uh, in her study, she explores how memory was instrumentally used by the Orange and the party of region uh, local elites after the uh, revolution of 2005. And uh, this, uh, I see my study as sort of in dialogue with uh, the study by Tatiana. Also executed the uh, Ukrainian Renaissance, uh, getting a growing attention in the public eye and uh, culture. However, local authorities never really pay attention to this traumatic period uh, in the city. So, uh, and then the Timothy Snyder in his essay, in, just in the immediate aftermath of the uh, Euromaidan, argued that Kharkiv, uh, is on the forefront uh, for the uh, battle of develop or development of uh, inclusive European identity. It was 100 years ago during the Ukrainian Renaissance and it, and it finds itself in the same position once again uh, nowadays. And, uh, and then in my study on the Russian Spring and Anti-Maidan, I come to the conclusion that uh, like unlike uh, Luhansk and Donetsk, Kharkiv remained un under Ukrainian control due a number of factors, such as uh, prompt reaction of the uh, new government, which had strong links to the region, and then uh, mobilization of the local Euromaidan. And uh, ironically, uh, it's also uh, the fact that uh, anti-Maidan suffered from the cultural trauma been so nostalgic about the Soviet Union, it's actually uh, demonstrated in a deep footprint 
uh, or trauma of the Soviet experience, which manifested in uh, uh, low levels of trust, which really crippled its grassroots initiatives and effectiveness. In my current study, I deploy a range of ethnographic uh, methods and come to this in the, which reveal the, the following. So maybe the most important memory work and contestation is going on around the new pantheon of heroes, having the hundred fallen defenders of Ukraine and Euromaidan activists. Conservative ethno-nationalist discourses remain largely unpopular among local population and is actively used by the local authorities, the local elites. The Euromaidan revolution and the effective mobilization of resources allowed uh, activists to challenge previously existing power structures. And here the control or projection of power over urban spaces is, uh, is, is, is crucial in understanding what is going on. And of course, decommunization had a profi profound uh, effect on uh, local toponyms, but uh, in nature it was quite, uh, quite formal. And aside from instrumental uses of memory, amnesia remains the most common response to the traumas of the past and to a large degree of the present. And finally, there is noticeable degree of uh, plasticity of monuments in Serhii Yakelchik's uh, language, and I will demonstrate this as well. So I would like to highlight uh, these uh, findings with uh, some empirical evidence. In the late uh, 70, uh, 80s and uh, early 90s, Kharkiv uh, had nearly no local resistance towards the creation of new uh, memory sites. So it's in the uh, uh, inst in installation of the first cross dedicated uh, commemorating the victims of uh, Holodomor in 1989. And at that time, local Ruch actively uh, interacted with the Canadian branch of Ruch. So no surprise uh, to find, and maybe it's some future study, that a lot of uh, narratives of victimhood were reintroduced uh, from the diasporic uh, set it. And then uh, one of the most challenged uh, monuments uh, was uh, to the Ukrainian insurgent army uh, was uh, created not far from this cross dedicated to Holodomor in Molodizhny or Youth Park. And uh, this is the most challenged uh, memory site which was systematically vandalized after the Orange Revolution in 2006, uh, it was uh, buried deep, deeply into the ground. In April 2013, when the Party of Region had uh, launched this uh, anti-fascist campaign, it was stolen. And uh, I also will come back to the discussion on its fate uh, a bit later. So the local leaders of the Party of Region, Gennady Kernes and uh, Mikhail Dobkin, uh, uh, both of which were, uh, uh, one is uh, the mayor of Kharkiv, uh, played a, an important role in the resistance to the uh, uh, Orange Central Authorities and, the, uh, and played a visible role in anti-fascist uh, campaign launched by their party. In September 2013, the plaque dedicated to the famous outstanding Kharkiv-born linguist Yuri Shevilo was brutally broken after he was declared a Nazi collaborator by Kerens. And also as uh, described by, uh, in the study of, uh, by Tatiana Zhurzhenko, the uh, monument, uh, and it's very ironically, the monument dedicated uh, to Holodomor-like peasants back in the 1930s uh, could not get into the city and remained in its outskirts. So this uh, really uh, interesting uh, interpretation of this, of this, the, of the outcome of this struggle. And then we come to the Yevromaidan revolution, which actually culminated in Kharkiv with a pro-Russian meeting was abruptly uh, stopped and uh, many of its participants just fled Ukraine. This very uh, day, uh, Euromaidan activists tried to topple the uh, Lenin monument in the central square. And uh, this was really uh, mobilizing uh, uh, action for the anti-Maidan. 
So the next day, the Temple of Defenders of Lenin was erected there and stayed for one month. Uh, during this period, the Euromaidan activists toppled 20 other monuments of Lenin, and this big one initially went down on 28th of September 2014. Gennady Karin has pledged uh, to restore it, but never did. And, um, and it, you know, it, it may seem that he and Dobkin are very caring about the Soviet past, but their actions uh, prior to Yaromaidan were quite different from their rhetoric. And they implemented quite a lot of decommunization before. Uh, for instance, they uh, replaced uh, the monument for the anniversary of the October Revolution, uh, which uh, quite often called locally as, uh, or was called locally as five carry in a fridge, with the goddess Nika on the ball, which like really transitioned to some like loose understanding of European identity. And this new uh, monument uh, has a plaque saying glory to Ukraine. So this slogan was uh, uh, later actively challenged by Dobkin and Karen's themselves. Another example is the alley dedicated to the Komsomol heroes, uh, featuring uh, uh, Zoya Kosmodinyanska, Alexander Matrosov, Lyalia Ubyvovk, and others. So it was quite brutally dismantled in 2013, and instead the, uh, the cathedral of the uh, church of uh, Orthodox Church of uh, the Moscow Patriarchate was uh, uh, built there. And it's also quite really signifies uh, the transition from a uh, more Sovietophile uh, identity towards more like Russophile one, and it's actually manifested in many other sites. I particularly like this example of decommunization. Uh, so, uh, in 2011, uh, Kernas approved the creation of like uh, Ukrainian Disneyland in the uh, Gorky Park. And uh, at the, uh, after this, the monument to uh, Maxim Maximovich was actually replaced by the monument to the squirrel. And the monument itself was uh, moved to the prison for use of fenders near Kharkiv, which was often visited by Gorky in the 20th century, as his friend Anton Makarenko worked there. And uh, the monument to Makarenko, uh, just across the road from, uh, from this site, was also removed. So coming back to the post-Maidan development, with the escalation of violence in the Donbas uh, in 2014, Kharkiv also saw the uh, war of monuments. And uh, Yeah, there was uh, resistance from the pro-Russian group called Kharkiv Partisans. They actually blown up the monument of UPA fighters on the 9th of December of 2014. At some point, the, uh, the monument or the memory place, the plaque was uh, painted in uh, the colors of the Polish flag. And on pro-Ukrainian side, monument Vigilantes, uh, is it possible to call them, uh, broke the plaque for Stepan Khalturin. And Khalturin actually was socialist who tried to assassinate the uh, Russian Tsar and was executed in uh, 1882. And uh, so he's not that relevant to the decommunization laws. And, uh, but it doesn't seem to bother much uh, local activists. But it wasn't until uh, decommunization laws were voted in, in 2015 when uh, many other monuments were toppled, like to Argenikidze, Sverdlov, and Ruti. And uh, there were two main stages of the communization in this city. Uh, there is a growing body of literature uh, analyzing the communization in, in Kharkiv and other Ukrainian cities. I just want to point out several moments. Yeah, there was attempts of some cheating. So, for instance, the city council was saying that the Frunze district is named after the son of Frunze who fought in the Second World War, so that is not really relevant to the communization. Or claiming that Dzerzhinsky is after the, not Dzerzhinsky we know, but Dzerzhinsky who was a doctor. Uh, this trick actually didn't work, and uh, with the uh, push from central authorities, there are quite a lot of uh, renaming uh, happened. 
And then it's uh, quite, as most of Ukrainian laws, the, uh, its application was uh, quite selective. So, for instance, like Ivan Bakulin and Alexander Zubarev, both were in the Soviet underground, uh, both were in Komsomol Krams leaders, both were tortured and killed by Gestapo during the Second World War. But uh, while Bakulin's street was renamed, Zubarev's street wasn't renamed. Or, or for instance, there was uh, Krivomazov street renamed to Mikola Bajan street. But uh, Bajan was deputy chairman of the Council of Ministers of the Ukrainian USSR. And actually after the war, he, in the West, he asked for deportation of Stepan Bandera back to Ukraine as a, uh, labeling him as a war criminal. So, and it doesn't seem to bother those uh, uh, making these propositions. And then uh, Petro Tranko, hero of Ukraine, and actually who did a lot after independence, but at the same time, uh, he was a highly ranked Soviet official. He was head of propaganda department in Soviet Ukraine. So there is really uh, so quite a lot of exceptions. At some point, uh, the communization worked as a cryptic crossword so, for instance, Chapayeva Street was renamed to Cavalry Street, the streets of the Red Fleet named Naval Street, and, and others. And uh, there are examples of uh, so-called decoloration. So, for instance, the street after Red Cossacks was renamed just Cossack Street. Or Red Latvian Rifleman Street was renamed just Latvian uh, Rifleman. So, uh, yeah, there is uh, really uh, a lot of going on and it's quite uh, complicated to figure out what was the uh, logic behind many names. And there are like really plasticity, destruction, desexualization and new memory sites. This was uh, happening afterwards. And I want to make some examples of this. So the new pantheon of heroes related to Heaven the Hundred, Yevromaidan and uh, and, and those who died defending Ukraine in the Donbass. Uh, I, I particularly like this example. So Nikola Rudnyov, Bolshevik fighter, uh, he, here you can see his monument uh, toppled. And uh, in the discussions, he was described as the Igor Girkin of the early 20th century. The square after him was renamed the square of the heavenly hundred. And actually there is a grave of him on the square and uh, once they decided to uh, rebury him somewhere else, they discovered that the grave was empty. It's really like facilitated understanding or like presenting the Soviet uh, narratives as really fake, like, uh, like the empty grave on the square. And Rudnev Lane and Rudnev Street were named after Yevgen Pluzhnev, the Antemirianian, uh, who actually the victim of the Stalin repressor. So it could be seen as some commemoration of the victim terror. Uh, also, uh, there was a terror attack uh, when the landmine exploded, killing uh, four people in 2015. And among them, Danilo Didik, a 15-year-old 15, 15 uh, pro-Ukrainian activist, who really uh, uh, became like very important figure in patriotic movement in Ukraine after his death. And uh, local authorities actually do not authorize the school to, be where, uh, to which he went to be named after him. And there is like really a movement and mobilization to make this happen. And uh, there is a Facebook group dedicated to this. And other cases, uh, the case of Miroslav Misla, uh, he was a member of Svoboda party and um, he died in the Donbass war. And that was like really huge and I would say a successful campaign for successful in terms of the scale uh, to rename the uh, heroes of Stalingrad Avenue after him. But once again, uh, it never happened. Uh, I assume that it was largely due to his uh, Svoboda affiliation. So the avenue was named after uh, Leo uh, Landau. But uh, in cases of other people who, who, who died in Donbass, it, it quite often happened, like in the case of Ruslan Plachotka, a helicopter uh, pilot who died near Stoyansk.
So, and there are other, like initially there was like really this Odoroblo or monstrosity case. It's like really example of successful uh, mobilization. Uh, Hinari Kernes uh, approved without proper competition the erection of the column uh, in, in the park just behind the former, where the Lenin's monument was. And, um, and then uh, activists like really mobilized effectively resources and uh, made the event public and also lodged some court cases and actually prevented Kernes from erecting what could be seen as like quite a uh, strong marker of the Russian world. And, and uh, this was actually for the first time when he was stopped from realizing his multi-million uh, project. So, but uh, again, uh, behind this, there are a lot of like uh, schemes which are built on the, uh, some legislation which uh, left from the Soviet Union and uh, the uh, struggle over here was not that successful. So a lot of investigations and court cases were dismissed or uh, so really substantial uh, decommunization and uh, fight against corruption is still uh, due to happen. And uh, the final case of monument I want on just uh, to the new heroes is the one was that was installed in the December 2013. And uh, it's really centered, it not was authorized by the city authorities. Uh, but then uh, this year, the uh, fountain where this other Oblo was supposed to be was built and opened uh, in last August. And uh, this new monument was removed without any resistance. So there is ongoing contestation. And uh, similarly to the case described by Professor Chernetsky, uh, Kernas actually uses uh, uh, Zhukov and the name of Zhukov and the Zhukov Avenue to mobilize his respective electorate. So after decommunization, uh, the avenue was named after dissident uh, Petro Grigorenko and Kernas uh, actually renamed it back to the uh, Zhukov Avenue. And uh, then it's a lot of tensions going on and uh, some court proceedings. On the, uh, and uh, it's, it still continues. So at some point, Kernus was ridiculed in the uh, style of the Love is Chevengam as a fan of Zhukov. I mean, like, uh, it didn't prevent him to call uh, Zhukov Grigory for several times. So this is like really instrumental uses. Of memory. And then very uh, like monuments with high plasticity, uh, these are dedicated to Cossacks. Uh, Kernas surprisingly accepted the monument for Hetman Sahaldachny, which was dismantled in Sevastopol. Then uh, the right-wing uh, organization Schidny Corpus or Eastern Corps installed a plaque in the Central Park and it was vandalized at some point. And then Kernes himself authorized the uh, erection of the Ivan Sirko monument. Uh, so there is a lot of use of this. And actually the leader of this uh, Eastern Corps uh, uh, later uh, had an argument or conflict with the uh, uh, right-wing leader Andrei Bilecki. And uh, at some point he joined actually pro-Russian organization affiliated with the uh, pro-Russian party called Patriots for Life. So it shows not only plasticity of monuments, but uh, political plasticity in the Ukrainian context. And I forego this, just these are examples how uh, Soviet monuments were uh, uh, repurposed uh, in order to uh, fit the uh, current ongoing cultural and political context. So, uh, and now some conclusions. So memory works deeply embedded in local politics. It serves the purposes of legitimation and actualization of particular political agendas. And here both activists and local authorities tend to rely on citizen history, very simplified like black and white uh, version of history and interpretation of historical events. The case of Kharkiv demonstrates uh, an important dynamic where supranational discourses are challenged by both conservative and national and new inclusive civic ones. Amnesia is not necessarily a bad thing, 
uh, as explained by John Nagel. And uh, as for urban community, uh, in some cases, it may help peace building and reconciliation. Local movements and grassroots initiatives are changing the city, but whether they ultimately deliver universalist European identity uh, described by Snyder, Snyder uh, remains an open question. And to finish this, uh, yeah, probably Jean-Francois Lyotard uh, didn't think about Kharkiv in his, when he was writing his book, but uh, it's actually uh, can serve as a picture for the color uh, for the color of his book so this now uh, demolished foundation of the uh, lenin monument really shows like our postmodern condition so some huge soviet damaged foundation covered with uh, scaffolding and uh, and uh, with some uh, religious and national symbols having uh, Lenin boots on top with the uh, Ukrainian uh, flag uh, sticking from one of them. So this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much. You concluded very, very, with a very nice picture. This palace says not only about the monument, but also the backdrop, having this famous constructivist building of Gosprom or Dershprom also at the backdrop add to this. Uh, postmodern condition, I guess. So thank you, that was informative and uh, personal thanks from me for this virtual tour around Kharkiv. So um, I think both presentations were a very nice continuation of the conversation we started in the previous panel, how local memories and identities uh, try to oppose to these kind of imposed visions of national traumas. and. Uh, I think that in the last presentation, we heard more about the political instrumentalization of different places of memory, while in the first presentation, it was more about like the complexity and the cultural richness. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's how I heard it to, to simplify a bit. I see a couple of questions and I hope that many more to follow and to, to start the Q&A session, I would probably use my special position of a chair because indeed what is specific about Kharkiv and Odessa or what puts these two otherwise very different uh, cities in the recent history of Ukraine is this infamous project of Novorossiya, right, that the Russian spring failed in both cities so they were not too much crucified to join this to create these native people's republics but at the same time they opposed to this kind of renationalization or whatever and the ironic coincidence is the zhukov personality i didn't know about the odessa case that the basically the zhukov avenue was um was an important case in point in in both uh, cities and interestingly from the central sort of ukrainian perspective it was rather not a battle for some local authenticity, but rather this sign of re-fertilization enabled by decentralization. This is that the concrete personalities of Truhanov and Kernis are just trying to play on this anti-Kiev sentiment of the people. Um, so what I want to, to ask you about all that, probably I will start with my questions to Vitaly. Um, this very fruitful concept of a multi-directional memory uh, i wonder how it works in real life so what is the platform to to move beyond this zero sum concept not only like i i heard you or your example of creating these spaces of dialogue where like local voices and, and different memories can play together with a certain respect and sensitivity to all of them. But um, are people receptive to these or what like how is it interiorized by the locals if you wish because we tend to think that uh, the zero-sum mindset is a sort of the political mindset and win-win mindset it refers to economy or something like that this sort of but in memory politics and these memory wars what would be the platform of non-zero-sum game thank you so much for a wonderful uh, thought-provoking question and uh, i would uh, suppose that actually it is uh, 
in part the creation of public spaces that have a certain educational but also intellectually fascinating aspect that we can see uh, that uh, those kind of things happening. Finding uh, points of shared pride and uh, shared investment and the, for example, the history of Odessa as the center of Ukrainian film industry during this heroic silent uh, film era of the 1920s would be a great case in point because this is something in which all the sides can find investment. And this is something where no, none of them can uh, argue for excluding the other because Odessa's film Renaissance was very much Ukrainian focused. It was very much built thanks to Dovzhenko taking the train famously from Kharkiv to Odessa in 1930, and you know, at the age of 32 in 1926, uh, and uh, with no luggage basically, and walking out and saying, I'll be a different person. And this kind of, kind of reinvention is what gave Ukrainian cinema its start. Uh, and the creation of uh, public spaces of this kind of uh, dialogue, they are, of course, now in the context of the COVID pandemic, it is very, very difficult, but there have been several of these uniting cultural spaces. One of them have been the Odessa Film Festival. The other one is the Odessa Classics Festival of Classical Music. They uh, reach across. So again, cinema is something that uh, reaches across the conventional divides. Classical music is also something that most people think is, you know, good and important and nice. And Odessa has a very strong legacy of that. Uh, similarly, through jazz music or through food. So they are, you know, the gastronomy tours. So now we have this uh, Odessa and from the Odessa, the tour of the surrounding countryside, the Odessa region, especially going in the direction of Danube. So Bujak, the southern part of the Odessa oblast as a place that rivals uh, Transcarpathia as a very sort of diverse and probably even more so than Transcarpathia place of uh, multiple ethnic uh, and cultural legacies coexisting. By bringing that and we can strengthen the narrative of the strength of Ukraine as a diverse place and that diversity is actually is its strength and uh, this takes away from the very very shallow narrative that uh, the dividers are trying to create through the wedge issues like the Zhukov renaming, uh, like uh, because they seem to be intent on just hitting the places of pain for the sake of just exploiting that pain. And multi-directional memory projects should not be just band-aid slapped on, but uh, trying to think of what could be a, a healing process that uh, appeals to shared interest, finding this shared positive place of investment, just like uh, with what Rothberg talks about in terms of overlap of Holocaust legacy and the legacy of anti-colonial struggles, you know, so struggles of the Jewish community and the struggles of, you know, the colonized, where were those places of, me of meeting and resistance and reinvention? Where there were these shared places of creating positive cultural legacy and highlighting them could hopefully take things in the positive direction. It is a bit of a utopian vision, but I think you have to be utopian dreamers because if you give up on that, then nothing good will happen. So you, one might as well try. And there are fortunately people trying. Nicely put. I don't remember who said that there are times when utopianism is the only realism. 
-hmm. right? So maybe we are at this point. So just a quick follow-up question. This ethos of inclusiveness and openness, does it extend beyond the Odessa region borders or it still in a sort of exists in a controversy with other regions of Ukraine? I would say that it does because of what happens is the good thing about Ukraine is that the regional borders are fuzzy. The oblast borders created in the 1930s are not the same as historical regions. So if we talk about, you know, the Northern Black Sea literal, that's a, that is one thing. You know, the Odessa region is where, you know, Podilia gradually sort of, you know, transforms into this, you know, sea coast and uh, there is a meeting of cultures. So the influence is coming from many different directions. It's what makes it, uh, I think, stronger. And the one part about Odessa and its relationship to the rest of Ukraine is just like all the other cities in Ukraine, ethnic Ukrainians were in the minority there until the great migration to the cities in the 1920s. It was true of Lviv, of Kyiv, of Kharkiv, of all the other big cities. But immediately, once you get outside the city limits, Ukrainian language is what you hear, uh, and where you know, persons of Ukrainian ethnic background constitute an absolute majority. So this is the urban-rural divide and the transformation of the urban-rural in the 20th century. This, this is a shared history, so it bears emphasizing. So this is something that is true for all the big cities in Ukraine. Wonderful. I do want to believe in this utopian project. I very much sympathize with that. And then going to the Kharkiv case, uh, my question to Ivan, um, because the whole discussion was built around this sort of local memories, local sensitivities and local traumas, right? Instead, like opposing to this imposition of some other memories. But the case of Kharkiv is quite specific because it was one of the main sites of Holodomor of the Great Famine. But at the same time, it is not oftentimes presented like that. So it's a very specific social operation with this trauma as being suppressed and delegated elsewhere. So I, how would you comment on, on that? Thank you very much for uh, this, uh, this question. I mean, um, you know, in the definition both by Alexander and Stonka, this uh, work, um, you know, like cultural traumas, like not just event, but a lot of like uh, cultural work surrounding them. And uh, Holodomor obviously uh, was like really absent from uh, cultural memory of uh, people of Kharkiv for quite a long time. And, uh, you know, if to research this issue like separately, I would say that diaspora was very crucial to reintroduce in scholarship on Holodomor and raising the awareness about it. And then uh, Viktor Yushchenko, and obviously Kharkiv was one of the centers of the resistance to the Orange Revolution, with like uh, Kushtaryov, really uh, uh, governor at that, that point, was like one of the leaders of this opposition. And uh, Yushchenko was ridiculed for this dedication to the uh, Holodomor and its com commemoration. But, uh, you know, after all these years, uh, it's possible to say that Although some proportion of people would sti still would be critical in particular definitions of Holodomor, but many accept it as a sort of this uh, narrative of Holodomor as the genocide of uh, Ukrainian uh, people. So we really can see that there is a change in cultural space along with the urban one. So, uh, yeah, there is quite a lot of, you know, um, small moments which are quite indicative that the change is happening, the change is, is there. And I think it's quite important to study the dynamics. I so what kind I, of change? How would you point it? Uh, I mean, like, if to step, uh, like, away from the case of Holodomor, for instance, like, linguistic uh, landscape is also changing. So from being universally, like, Russian-speaking city, uh, there is more and more Ukrainian uh, 
in the city and uh, and then described in Kharkiv region as a Russian speaking so this is my small protest to the description by Professor Hitzak it's not actually the case we have but like very imperial russified city but the oblast itself is very colorful very different uh, culturally linguistically historically so you know to put this just blanket definition of Russian speaking or otherwise which is uh, could be quite overstretched and there is a greater awareness about uh, not only linguistic but ethnic minorities of the city for instance I would say that in the independence year the awareness about uh, Jewish uh, minority and Jewish identity of Kharkiv it made tremendous progress and uh, yeah and Dobkin and Kernas also I would say would be uh, manifestations of this like inclusive identity pathway so this at least something positive delivered by these uh, politicians rather than divisive uh, discourse yeah thank you for highlighting this silver lining in the Kharkiv case so I'm going back to to Vitaly, and would you want to address two questions from the Q&A? Yes, Shall I uh, read them or? I, I can perhaps try to summarize. Uh, my big uh, thanks both to Olesi Sayuk and to Irina Rudik uh, for their questions. Um, first, uh, the question uh, from Olesi Sayuk, uh, which is about the the relationship uh, between the Odessa myth and the history of the Ukrainian South in the 16th, 17th century. Um, yes, uh, there definitely has been this long discourse in the city that actually has restarted. And this is one of those public discussions about not starting uh, the history of Odessa from 1794, but actually thinking about the continuity with uh, Kochubeyev, Hajibay, and uh, going back to the days of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania in the 14th century and the relationship uh, of that. Today, as it happens, uh, they have just started having identified through the GEO radar the site of the Forteza Hajibay. Um, they have started the archaeological excavations. So on the territory of Odessa, of course, we have ancient Greek stuff. We have also these very rich things from the Middle Ages and, uh, and the er early modern period. So yes, definitely that linkage is highly important. Uh, there is a cultural project of which I've only seen a trailer, but there is a new film, a Ukrainian-Turkish co-production called Forteza Hajibay, which is a very interesting example of actually an adventure story that is set at the fortress at the time of the Russo-Turkish War, where the Russians are the bad guys who are about to conquer, and we have the partnership between Ukrainian Cossacks and local uh, multicultural city and its Turkish administration trying to rescue as much as possible from the Russian plundering. And of course, there is a beautiful Turkish woman and a handsome Ukrainian Cossack. So it's a very fluffy piece of entertainment, but potentially something that could be useful. As for the legacy of the father and son, Ivan and Yuri Lipa in the city's memory, it cannot be overemphasized how important that is because they indeed uh, placed Odessa and Tornomoria at the center of thinking about Ukrainian identity. In the city, they are known and respected, but I don't think they have sufficiently been appreciated to the extent that they should be. Um, you know, that's about as far as we go. It's, I wouldn't say that they were, they have been appropriately read. And speaking of the street renamings, this is actually where Odessa is very different from all the other cities of the, uh, the more Russified parts of the south and the east of Ukraine in that the renaming of communist street names happened in early 1990s, almost immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union without any trouble. And it was not only the restoration of the names of the uh, uh, pre-revolutionary street names, but also giving new names 
to uh, the re honor the heroes of you know Ukrainian struggle for independence, and uh, that's why there was Vuitya Stusa, there was Vuitya Ivana Yuri Lip. The most interesting case, perhaps, was. Uh, the renaming of one of the streets uh, after Roman Shulkevich, and that was done specifically to spy to the local ex-KGB uh, because they were now located at the corner of Yevreyska and Shulkevich, both of which were supposed to make those Soviet folk in their mentality highly uncomfortable. And in terms of uh, the uh, projects for construction, uh, the memory that Irina uh, Rudek is asking about the, the dialogue spaces that we have in the Odessa Art Museum or in several hub spaces, like the new hub created there, the Hrushevsky Library in the city, had been doing precisely that. In terms of working with the city archives, this is a, one of the major sore points, actually, that the dismal situation of the local archives and that they're located, you know, still most of the archives are in the Obosne Archive, which is in the uh, building of one of the old synagogues, which was not meant to be an archive and which is falling apart. So this is where the physical limitations for accessibility are a major hampering point. Thank you so much. And now I'm again giving the floor to Ivan, but before doing so, I'm giving you the last opportunity to pose your question in the chat, because otherwise we will be wrapping up after Ivan's responses. So please, Ivan. Uh, uh, first, uh, as uh, the one question was uh, addressed to both of us, I mean, like, uh, there are uh, lots of methodologies could, could be applied in research uh, on memory and trauma and so on. As a sociologist, uh, I mean, like for me, the, this part of history, which is uh, used in popular discourses or instrumentally in, in some political engagements or important for uh, mobilization, it matters. I mean, like it's really important to see what is mentioned and what, what is avoided. And, and then try to figure out uh, why it happens. So, so just uh, to take this part of the question, I think it's important that uh, uh, various uh, methodologies and approaches can be deployed in, in, in this research. And then uh, about comparing, I hope uh, everyone can see this question in the chat about comparing Kharkiv to Lviv during the Ukrainian-Polish conflict, um, I would struggle with this comparison. I mean, uh, although uh, there are these clashes and apparently some political divisions, but uh, in, in Kharkiv still are, but I would struggle to define them as ethnic. Uh, in contrast, uh, uh, I would see that there are moments which point out that uh, Kharkiv more and more uh, embraces diversity and uh, various aspects of diversity, linguistic, ethnic, uh, or even uh, quite noticeable and quite strong LGBT movements. I mean, uh, there is a lot of things uh, going on and I would struggle to compare it with 1930s. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, war or like proximity of war, yes, Kharkiv could be described as, as the city on the brink of war. But at the same time, you know, those uh, citizens of Kharkiv who prefer to distance themselves from the war, they really like uh, turn a blind eye on what is going on. So a lot of uh, uh, Euromaidan activists and the by association like uh, fighters who had had conversations with, they are like really shocked about how close to the conflict in Donbass Kharkiv is and how it's, uh, the city doesn't pay attention to it. So, yeah, and also I would say that it's also hard to say that which Ukrainian institutions or what was demolished in, in Kharkiv after the Euro Maidan, except for monuments. I, I would struggle to, to take this comparison further. Uh, so yeah, I hope. <laughs> I answered this question. Thank you. 
Thank you. So I guess we ran out of time and out of questions. Thank you so much to both presenters. As much as I love theories, but good case studies presented in such a brilliant way are really insightful, so thank you. And I want to remind everyone that we are continuing tomorrow at 4 p.m. CAT, so please join us tomorrow. And again, thank you. Sorry, we do not have a follow-up dinner. I wish we were not in Corona times, maybe. Hopefully next time. Thank you. Thank you.